Lord, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. Amen. Amen. Mr. Speaker, we know that mental health and addictions issues are top of mind for many NWT residents and they are also a priority area in the mandate of this Legislative Assembly. To guide our work to address these important issues affecting our communities, the Department of Health and Social Service developed a strategic framework for mental health and addictions recovery in the fall of 2016. One of the important focus areas of the framework was to ensure that mental health and addiction services are delivered locally and culturally appropriate methods. I am pleased to provide members with an update on our work to support on the land healing initiatives as part of our overall approach to addressing mental health and addictions issues in our territory. Mr. Speaker. Collectively, we have become much more aware of the devastating and prolonged effects of residential schools and other forms of systemic abuse which continue to affect Indigenous peoples and communities in the Northwest Territories. We know that many survivors of residential school continue to live with the effects of this abuse, along with the impacts of racism and marginalization, and some have turned to alcohol and drugs in order to cope. While there is no one solution to address the intergenerational impacts and legacy of residential schools on the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples, families, or communities, our health system needs to be able to support our residents on their healing journey. To do this, our health and social services system must respect traditional healing approaches and support Indigenous residents so that they may choose for themselves the path to wellness that will be, be most relevant and meaningful, including on-the-land options. We have heard from residents and Indigenous leaders through our community engagement that on-the-land support is necessary and foundational part of their healing journey. A few years ago, we established the On-the-Land Healing Fund for Mental Health and Addictions. This supports Indigenous governments in developing and delivering culturally relevant and safe land-based healing programs specific to the regions, cultures, and peoples. The Department allocates $1.23 million annually to fund accessible uh, to regional Indigenous governments and community-based Indigenous governments. In 2018-19, a total of eight contribution agreements have been signed. During this time, we have also taken steps to ensure that land-based and culturally-based programs are supported as part of our overall mental health and addictions system. Mr. Speaker, the Government of the Northwest Territories has taken another significant step towards supporting land-based healing options for our residents. We're proposing a new land-based programming with specific focus on mobile addictions treatment and family-based treatment. For many years, our residents have told us that there is a need for mobile treatment options and person and family-centered approaches to mental wellness and addiction recovery support. And we're taking the steps and actions to bring those options to them. Mobile treatment refers to treatment that takes place in a community setting by coming to the community instead of having people travel outside of their communities to get help and support they need. This approach puts strong emphasis on community involvement and before an actual treatment program is implemented, the community must acknowledge that a substance abuse problem exists and be committed, to in, in, committed and involved in addressing the problem. Part of how we work to ensure that mobile treatment is providing meaningful and lasting benefits to residents is by making sure that community resources and stakeholders are involved in the preparation and coordinating aftercare and recovery supports. The importance of aftercare and recovery supports as part of our mobile treatment approach was echoed by the Standing Committee on Social Development, who provided recommendations around addiction programming following their tours of addiction treatment facilities in December 2017. These recommendations include improving approaches to aftercare for individuals returning from addictions treatment, enhancing peer support, and providing family support programs for addictions. Mr. Speaker, our proposed land-based mobile addictions treatment approach addresses these recommendations in several ways. Land-based mobile addiction treatment activities can, can serve as an important support for individuals returning from addictions treatment and who need support to solidify their recovery. 
Participation in land-based activities connects participants with other individuals also working towards recovery from addictions, which enhances their social network and connections with peers who can provide support. And Indigenous governments can use funding to provide land-based mobile treatment and aftercare activities to invite individuals and families. Mr. Speaker, a great deal of work still needs to happen to improve health and social outcomes of Indigenous people. The mobile treatment option is an important step taken in addressing what we heard from residents and aligns with this government's mandate, commitment towards supporting individuals in the recovery journal, journey from addictions. Recovering the uniqueness, recognizing the uniqueness of each person's journey and that there are many pathways to wellness, the department provides a variety of support services including the community counseling program, child and youth care counselors located within the school system, and southern treatment options, to name just a few. This work represents the beginning of a system-wide transformation focused on creating safer spaces, increasing accessibility, and enhancing approaches to care across the spectrum of mental health and addictions recovery in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister statements. Minister statements. Member statements. Member for Nanakwut. Kuyanaini, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Senator Margaret Dawn Anderson is an Inuvialik who was raised in Tuktoyaktuk, Northwest Territories. She's the daughter of Ms. Sarah Anderson. She holds a bachelor's degree in child and youth care with distinction from the University of Victoria, where she is currently completing her master's in Indigenous governments. Senator Anderson worked with the Government of Northwest Territories for 22 years with the Department of Health and Social Services and the Department of Justice. Mr. Speaker, before returning to school, Ms. Anderson served in various roles with the Government of the Northwest Territories. Notably, she was the Director of Community Justice and Policing, where she implemented positive changes to the territorial justice system. She also helped developed to implement the Territory's Wellness, Wellness Court Program, a ther therapeutic program that attempts to reduce recidivism by, re by treating underlying issues like mental health addictions and cognitive challenges. Senator Anderson's dedication to the Northwest Territories and to improving the lives of, our, uh, of others is best displayed through her work as an active member of the D Domestic Violence tre Treatment Options Court and the development of the implementation of the Planning Action Responsibility towards toward non-violent empowered relationships partner program. A, a northern-based program for low to medium risk domestic violence offenders, she also conducted a review of the Northwest Territories Community Justice Program through cons consultations which resulted in a, pro in a report with several recommendations to improve community-based restorative justice programming. Senator Anderson also was also engaged in development of implementation and rollout of Integrated Case Management Program, ICM, pilot project, which aims to create, fo create foster, and deliver a coordinated, collaborative, multi-departmental, client-centered approach that removes system barriers and service gaps for individuals with complex needs. ICM is, is led by the Department of Justice, and it is in partnership with Education, Culture, Employment, Health and Social Services, the Yellowknife Health and Social Services Authority, Authority, and the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. Mr. Speaker, I, speak unanim I, I, I seek unanimous consent to con continue my, my statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Member, uh, member statements. I not I saw the the I mean, I what do you get anyone? Member Nanakput, such a no again. Uh, Kiyanani, Mr. Speaker, colleagues. Mr. Speaker, continuing, most recently, Senator Anderson worked for the Inuvial Regional Corporation in Nuvik as she prepared for her defense on her community governance project. In this role, she participated in Inuvial itself government negotiations between the Inuvial Regional Corporation and the Government of Northwest Territories and also the Government of Canada. Mr. Speaker, Senator Anderson is a two-time recipient of the Territorial uh, Premier's Award for excellence in her leadership and commitment to improving the lives of Northerners in both the individual and team category. She's a strong leader with a great passion for helping others. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to share that Dawn has been appointed as a Senator for the Northwest Territories on December 12, 2018, and she's also the first time female Senator to represent the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, take this time to commend Ms. Anderson on her achievements and also her, 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 the, the, the role model that she is not for just in Ivalwit, but Indigenous women across the territory. Kuyanani, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> member statement. Member Ike, go down in the member Yalnaif Center.
Mr. Speaker, today I'm reflecting on the fifth annual Anti-Poverty Roundtable held in Hay River in November. I appreciate the Minister's invitation to attend and being able to hear from colleagues taking action on poverty throughout the territory, as well as the opportunity to see what local organizations are doing and to meet their dedicated staff. There is no question that anti-poverty efforts have come a long way since the GNT GNWT Anti-Poverty Action Plan was introduced. The Anti-Poverty Fund for Grassroots Projects is now $1 million. There is more support for homelessness in communities outside of Yellowknife <coughs> and for youth. Income assistance clients receive more transfers from government than ever before. But while government is doing more, I'm sad to say it is not doing enough. One in four children in the NWT live in poverty. The No Place for Poverty Coalition made 21 recommendations to the Minister to strengthen the next Anti-Poverty Action Plan, and we look forward to hearing they've been adopted. Mr. Speaker, the Action Plan needs to include well-defined goals, for which there is required funding for implementation and robust evaluation. It needs to focus on long-term solutions. Let's take hunger as an example. Stats Canada says one-third of NWT children live in homes where having enough to eat is an issue. In addition to funding initiatives that respond to people who are hungry today, government needs to develop and pilot programs that improve food availability and affordability over the long term. I also recommend both short and long-term goals that relate to increasing the benefits paid by income assistance. Almost 5% of the territory's population is supported by income assistance, a number that has been growing, especially in Yellowknife and the Beaufort Delta. While the department hasn't been able to provide analysis of how long families stay on income assistance, my sense is that some families rely on it from one generation to the next, to their detriment. Mr. Speaker, an investment in poverty reduction pays off by requiring government to spend less on the negative effects of poverty, including poor health, poor educational outcomes, and poor employment prospects, to name a few. I will have questions about the action plan for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Merci. Merci. Member statement. Member, you can go down in the member of Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think it's fair to say that this week we're all breathing a little easier. For many Northerners, labour disruptions bring up painful memories of deep divisions in our community. Thankfully, we have avoided a reoccurrence and we hope we can achieve a final resolution that respects our dedicated professional public service members and the services they provide. Mr. Speaker, as elected MLAs, it's important that we remember who put us here. The value of the work we do in this building must always be measured by its impact on our constituents and the people who, they are the people who gave us their trust. So in turn, it's important to recognize the work of members of the media who help people understand complex public issues. We live in a time when the media has a huge impact in our lives, so it is increasingly important that we can trust what we hear and what we see. In context of recent weeks, I'd especially like to compliment the work of Ollie Williams at Cabin Radio. His reports about the negotiations were frank and open and offered in-depth explanation of difficult and potentially divisive issues. In a situation where emotions can run high and conflict is too easily reached, his balanced, fair reporting was crucial to serving the public interest. Another example of the Northern media providing important understanding was at the AME Roundup in Vancouver. Northern media, including CBC's Hillary Bird, were covering Roundup for the first time this year and were able to better convey the importance of the work that happens there. I know that not everybody agrees that our government should invest in as much as we do in, at Roundup, but fair and balanced coverage of issues and events like these are crucial to our residents' knowledge and understanding of the issues to enable them to reach their own informed opinions. Mr. Speaker, sadly we live in the days of fake news, when even known facts are argued, debated and disputed. In such times, honest, balanced and fair journalism is crucial in providing people with real understanding of public issues. In the small, close-knit community of the North, we are fortunate to be well served by principled and impartial journalistic community. I am pleased to take this opportunity to acknowledge their important contribution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. 
Member statement. Member Ike, go down in the member frame lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, on October 11th of last year, I made a member statement on the issue of coordination of parental leave benefits with the changes to federal legislation that will improve these benefits. These changes to the Canada Labour Code will provide a minimum of five weeks paid leave for each parent. The changes were originally to come into effect on June 1st, 2019, but the federal government recently moved up that effective date to March 17th of this year. Amendments are required uh, of our Employment Standards Act that will require employers to honour extended leave requests from their employees. I commend the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment for fast-tracking our public consultations on amendments to the Employment Standards Act that closed on January 14th. Um, and the expanded scope of leave for domestic violence, uh, caregivers and others as proposed by the Department. Clearly, though, we will not be ready for the effective date of the federal legislation on March 17th. It's not clear how long it will take us to catch up to the federal government and ensure that our families are entitled to the same parental leave benefits as other Canadians. Such benefits clearly lead to stronger families, and I'm disappointed that we did not coordinate our efforts more closely with what the federal government has been doing. Although this is obviously a sensitive area, yet another method to ensure parents receive the best possible benefits would be for our government to unilaterally offer to amend collective agreements to ensure that our employees would have their jobs protected while away on the improved federal parental leave. I will questions for the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment later today to make sure that our families receive the best possible parental leave. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Member statement. Member Ike, go down and then Member Cam Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at this point we have roughly six months left in our time as MLAs in this before this Assembly wraps up. And I'm happy to hear that the long-awaited Mineral Resources Act will finally be made public, and today I would like to address the Minister's comments rather than put the particulars of the legislation itself. The Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment has spoken at length in public and in this House about the benefits of the new Act. It will bring improved regulatory certainty while respecting treaty rights, more benefits to communities from mining activity, superior consultation with stakeholders, predictable dispute resolutions, a clear competitive regulatory framework for the 21st century. The list goes on. Many in the mineral resources industry and Indigenous organizations and governments continue to express their dis dissatisfaction that one of the most significant pieces of regulatory legislation, the Mackenzie Valley Resource Management Act, remains firmly in the hands of Ottawa and out of reach of this Assembly, and arguably out of touch with the realities on the ground. I have not yet heard any member of the Executive Council make devolution of this crucial and foundational piece of regulatory authority a priority of this government. Until the MVRMA is brought home for Northerners to shape, our regulatory regime will sorely be lacking in predictability and, I will and will be continue, to continue to be difficult to navigate at best. I do wonder though, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the years of public engagement and collaboration have really resulted in a government that understands the concerns, needs and wants of the people it is here to represent in regards to this new legislation. The perspective, further the perspectives of industry and Indigenous partners for that matter. The Minister has made some mutually exclusive comments on the MRA which have left me and many members of the public understandably confused. On January 30th, published in the Yellowknife, the minister is quoted discussing the Mineral Resources Act. I'm not happy with it. Indigenous governments won't be happy with it. Industry isn't going to be happy with it. Then, Mr. Speaker, on February 8th in this House, According to, Han according to Hanser, the minister said, quote, it is the accumulation of years of research, public engagement, collaboration with indigenous governments and organizations, and constant engagement with the industry. So why do we have a clear, mutually exclusive definition of the bill based on the minister's comments? I would like him to clarify this for the record so we can truly understand if this legislation is meeting the needs of Northerners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Member statement. Member Ike, go down and then Member Satu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Promising gold to find in the Satu region. Mr. Speaker, I am happy to highlight for my colleagues a new exploration discovery coming from the Satu region. It comes from Evram 
Resources Corporation, a precious and base metals project generator, who in January announced surface sampling results from their Astro Gold project. This project is joint between Evram and Newmount Mining Corporation, one of the world's largest gold producers. It has led to the acquisition of a 23,250 square kilometers prospect land package along the border of the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Of note is the discovery of note is the discovery of a 9.5 kilometer long gold trend that includes samples returning up to 11.6 grams per tonne of gold over significant widths. Evram discovery is the result of two years of boots on the ground exploration from their exploration teams. The Astro Gold Project is located six kilometers north of the Mile 222 airstrip and 195 kilometers northeast of the community of Ross River along the Canal Road, which is providing seasonal road access to the southern boundary of the property. Evram and Newmount are now acquiring the necessary permits for a drill program for this coming summer. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Masi. Member, uh, member statements, like in the day, I said the Suha, the Nek, I don't know. I'm a animal. What do you think? Member saw true, no doubt, as such a no again. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Evram CEO recognized in the news release that the Astro project is located within the traditional territory of the Satu Dene and Metis Comprehensive Land Claim and stated that both Evram and Newmount are committed to developing a positive and mutually beneficial relationship based on respect and transparency. Mr. Speaker, the results reported by Evram are encouraging especially in a region that is known for its oil and gas, these are very few surface showings found anywhere in the world reporting this grade and width of gold. It speaks to the NWT's mineral potential in the Satu. We are looking forward to the future of the project and prosperity it will bring to the Satu residents and the people of the Northwest Territories. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Masi, member statement, member Ike Goddan and the member Dehcho. Masi, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we all know that addictions issues are a serious problem in the Northwest Territories. I'm on the Standing Committee on Social Development. Last year, we tabled a report on adult residential addictions treatment facilities. What we found out will not come as a surprise. The NWT faces an uphill battle when it comes to dealing with addictions. For example, our research told us that in 2015-16, the NWT had the second highest per capita level of alcohol consumption in Canada. Not counting bootlegging, sales, and our residents were hospitalized due to alcohol consumption at a rate of 1,315 people per 100,000. On top of that, Residents of our small communities were likely to experience harm from drinking or, f or from someone's drinking. News headlines regularly tell us that illegal drugs are coming to the NWT and harming vulnerable people. Northerners have often called on their MLAs and on this government to offer addiction treatment options in the NWT. Currently, residents have the choice of four facilities in Alberta and BC. Mr. Speaker, after standing empty for about 15 year, uh, for five years, the Dene Wellness Center opened Wednesday, January 9, 2019 on the Hay River Reserve. With room for 64 people overnight, the center plans for wellness programming deeply rooted in Dene values and laws. Executive Director Heidi Yardley has worked across the north and is a, and is a psychologist and therapist. 
The centre will have ceremonial and traditional practices as an important component of healing. The Hutl two Hutlodeche First Nation elders, Pat Martel and Raymond Sonfer, will guide and help oversee the work of the centre. Mr. Speaker, Yardley also has her staff sign a policy agreeing to follow the Dene laws. Quote, we don't have a formal code of conduct because that's not the Dene way. We follow the Dene laws and the Dene values, unquote. Yardley would also like to create a traditional knowledge holder position. However, it is dependent on funding. Indigenous groups from across the NWT are involved in the center. An advisory council has been established with invites going out to groups from every treaty settlement uh, region in the territory. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Merci. Merci. Member, uh, member, member statements. Thank you very much. 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 Member, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, an advisory council is being established with invites out to groups from every treaty settlement region in the NWT. The Northwest Church of Smithy Nation, the GWT, and the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation are also involved. The center will be running recovery, trauma, and depression groups over the next few months. The building sat vacant since 2013 when the territorial government shut the territory's last treatment center down. The Hutto Deche First Nation had been actively negotiating with the NWT government to access the building since 2016. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Must see. Member statement. Member Ike, go down and then Member Tunade will today. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Tulsa River. Uh, and the uh, Tulsa uh, Hydro Dam development. To its end, a chunte stane rana. I tane teschana in tenle. Hello, and 1959. Um. And uh, the school burnt in uh, in the late 50s. Before the people were there and kids were going to school there. Yeah, there's a lot of people living on the other side. Of people used to live very well there. Uh, people were trapping. After the school burnt down, the people were moved. A lot of people moved to uh, Yellowknife. They had no jobs. None of them went to school. They can't trap anymore once they got here, once they can't hunt here. That's where they ended up. They ended up in the streets and they died here. The, some of the people that moved to Port Resolution that lived there it was a little better there. They didn't have very much to work with. The government didn't help them much. They will not be building the school back in Rosh River, they were told. Uh, in case the kids wanted to go to school, they had to move to Port Resolution. But people were still trapping around the area. There were still few people living there. The people that were living around the Tolson River were well provided for. There was a lot of beavers, there was a lot of fur. My mother told me about 1957. My dad killed so much beavers there. My mom, my dad, and another lady used to help us. Yeah, they had to all work together to 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 get to prepare the fur. Uh, some days there was so much fur he couldn't hunt. After 1964, uh, in the springtime we go back to where we trapped. We went back to 1964, there was nothing there. There was absolutely no game, or anything to hunt. Every, in, during the winter time, when the, the flooding was happening in the winter, all the beaver 
dams and and muskrat lodges were all flooded out and they were all they were all killed there were no more game that's the dam is the cause of it and the government is going to be working on that again uh, this week here the the Tolson River that being talked on uh, I'm going to be reading all the documents that's uh, pertaining to the the dam developed, and then I will be asking the government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mrs. Speaker, today I have a concern from Sigichik on how the department is micromanaging the ice bridge construction in Sigichik. In the past, the contract with the community was to supply all labor and equipment needed to complete the work. We have seen a huge shift in how this work is done since a de decision was made to extend the ferry service during the winter months. The department at that time even brought a number of their staff and equipment from the South Slave region to work with the community. Since then, Mr. Speaker, the department now uses their own heavy equipment, snowcats, backhoes, bombardiers, sprayer and auger. This is taking revenue away from the community of Tsigichik and other small business owners in our region. The department will probably say they are trying to recover overspending but in fact, this overspending is due to operating their own equipment and not how our community is managing the contract. Mr. Speaker, while the department believes they are saving money by using their equipment, what they are actually doing is taking employment away from my constituents, many of which look forward to this seasonal work, especially just before Christmas. This year we had 14 people working at the beginning, but that was that only lasted for 16 days. Then in December, we only had four people employed and three in January. So you can imagine how disappointed the workers were. Usually they get six weeks worth of work in during, during this time before Christmas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we'll have questions later today. Merci. Merci. Member statement. Member Ike, go down to the member Nehende. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Daniel Lair was born in Fort Simpson on January 26, 1975, to Phoebe and Daniel Lair. He was raised and lived his whole life in Fort Simpson. He passed away on January 12, 2019. After graduating high school, Danny worked as a seasonal crew leader fighting fires with GWT and later with NOAA fire crew. During the winter months, Danny spent his time on the lands he so loved so much. He would trap and hunt at the Notenda Lake with his grandparents, Gabe and Mary Kazon, and other family members. In 2000, Danny left for Fort Smith to attend the Aurora College along with his father, Daniel. They both enrolled in the Environmental and Natural Resource Program, and in 2002, Danny and his dad graduated with honours. After graduating in the spring of 2002, Danny's career as a wildlife technician began at ENR. Being a wildlife technician for Danny was immensely rewarding, enabling him to travel and study wildlife across the north. A large part of Danny's work was serving caribou, bison, sheep, and moose. He was quite proud of his many co-written scientific research papers with with his supervisor, Nick Larder, and having them published. Being the hunter he was, when somebody asked where all the moose, Danny's reply, in the bush. He was taught to hunt, fish, and trap in the ever-revolving traditional atmosphere with teachings from his parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. He caught his first martin at the age of four and shot his first moose at 14. He was very close to his family, especially his sister, Danita. He was always willing to share his knowledge and pass on traditional ways to his younger cousins. Danny was an artist. He understood beauty and words and saw beauty and expression. He loved music, dancing, laughing with his many friends. He carved, painted, drew pictures, wrote poetry, sang, and listened to music. He was a photographer, always wanting to share the moments he captured. Danny's appreciate, appreciated relationships, whether it was the land, family, or friends. There were many weekends when you would walk into his house and you could hear, hear his roaring laugh. 
laughter. It wasn't laugh. If he wasn't laughing, he was singing along to one of his many many favorite bands somewhere offbeat. But never that never mattered. In times of trial and tears, let's remember him saying, "Can't we all just get along and maybe smile in memory?" The, the Lair and the Kazon family would like to thank everybody for all their love and support in the difficult times. We've all been we. We've all been blessed to know him and share his life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, <clears throat> our condolences to the family as well and to the community. Member statements. <coughs> Member statements. Returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Colleagues, I'd like to draw your attention to the presence in the gallery. We have with us, I'd like to welcome uh, the new NWT Senator to our proceedings, Senator Don Anderson. Must be for being here with us. And also, uh, presence uh, before us is Mr. David Jones, the Conflict of Interest Commissioner for the Northwest Territories, who has joined us in the gallery today. Later on this afternoon, I will table the Conflict of Interest Commissioner 2018 Annual Report. Thank you for joining us. Recognition of visitors and gallery. Member for Nanakput. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier, I made my member statement on Don Anderson, uh, our newest senator, and uh, I'd like to welcome Don to, uh, to the Legislative Assembly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Don's um, probably sat in here as a uh, uh, with the Department of Justice and other departments, so I, I'd like to uh, commend her for the hard work that she does across the territory and across Canada now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. <coughs> Recognition of visitors in gallery. Recognition of visitors in gallery. <coughs> Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Member for Nanakput. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I have questions for the Minister of Municipal Community Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Politan and Sachs Harbour are ideal locations to monitor winter storms in the high Arctic. No, uh, another roof blew apart during this last storm in Politech as the winds reached 140 kilometres. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, my first question to the Minister is how often are community emergency plans exercised and updated across the territory, mainly those in, in, uh, in the Barren Lands? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister of Municipal Community Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank the uh, leadership and the people of uh, uh, the community of Paulituck uh, Paul that uh, stepped up to the plate uh, during this uh, past weekend when we had uh, winds that reached up to about 140 kilometers per hour to uh, take care of our elders, our youth, and and those most vulnerable in the uh, in the community, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, the new Territorial Emergency Management Act does require communities to update their uh, emergency uh, plans annually. Uh, our staff also do a good, great job in uh, coordinating and working with our leadership to make sure that these plans are uh, updated uh, on a regular basis and that they actually go through. Uh, uh, tabletop exercises at the community level. Uh, we'll continue to do this not only with the uh, coastal communities uh, in the Beaufort Delta region, but all our communities across the Northwest Territories, uh, as well as those on the, uh, the Mackenzie River. And uh, we want to make sure that um, we can prevent anything from happening in terms of uh, uh, emergencies such as uh, what happened this past weekend in, uh, in Polituck, as well as the other communities in the uh, members writing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, Akira Kasi member Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the response from the Mr. Mr. Speaker, I strongly believe that we as an assembly should be seeking disaster mitigation funding to help homeowners and helmets across the territory to prepare as weather storms are becoming more extreme um, uh, across the Northwest Territories, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, which uh, impacts day-to-day -day operations and our infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister is, how do you plan on building resi resiliency, resiliency in communities who face such climate change effects as the number of winter storms increase in the high Arctic? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Masi, Minister of Municipal Community Affairs. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the Department of Municipal Community Affairs will continue to work closely with community governments uh, to update the NWT hazard identification risk assessment. Uh, we'll also continue to uh, lobby our, our federal counterparts uh, to look at increasing funding or continuing some of the, uh, the, uh, the funding that we have used in the past years to uh, mitigate any type of uh, emergency uh, situations. Um, we'll obviously continue to work with our leadership, uh, work with our uh, community members that will address some of these emergency issues uh, moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our question is Tada Dea, Cassie Member in the uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the response from the Minister. It seems like uh, the MAC is doing a good job in, in uh, including the communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, leading up after that question, uh, my question to the Minister is how will MAC incorporate Indigenous knowledge into their local, regional and territorial emergency planning? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Municipal Community Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, mentioned in uh, previous response, we will look at working with our leadership, uh, our local membership in the, uh, the communities to address any kind of emergency management situations uh, and how we deal with those. Uh, also with planning, community plans, we're going to be working with our community leadership to, to, to develop them so that it does mitigate any kind of uh, emergency risks uh, right across the Northwest Territories. And obviously we have seen over the last couple of, uh, uh, over the last few years, uh, situations up in our coastal communities that have do have an impact. Uh, I have brought it up to the uh, f our federal minister. I've also brought it up to our uh, national indigenous leaders about such things as permafrost degradation. Uh, talked about uh, coastal erosion, uh, as well as uh, with the opening of the uh, Northwest Passage, passage, and seeing more vessels coming through. That we need to be prepared for uh, any kind of situation that happens especially in the, uh, the members' riding. And uh, I have invited some of our, uh, like I said, our uh, federal minister to come up and see what we are doing to try to mitigate that risk. I've also uh, invited uh, some of our uh, national indigenous uh, organization leaders to come see uh, the unique situation of the uh, Northwest Territories, the North, and how we need support on a, uh, a bigger front, and we will, like uh, as I mentioned, continue to work with the uh, membership of the communities as well as the leadership, who are the uh, the experts in this region, and bringing that traditional knowledge into uh, consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, our question. No today, Cassie, member in output. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That answered uh, almost my my last question here. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we sometimes see climate change only in the spring and the summer months when, when, you know, during the melt and the thaw and sometimes when the water levels rise along the McKenzie River or the Arctic Ocean or other lakes across the territory. Uh, Mr. Speaker, but we, we need to think about, uh, about the winter as well too and, and the, 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 the large storms that are coming. Um, I will ask this question anyways, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister com consider Nanakba communities who face extreme winds during the winter months to access disaster mitigation funding to, to protect housing infrastructure and also the municipal infrastructure that, that, uh, 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 that are impacted during the winter months? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister of Municipal Community Affairs. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, currently, the, uh, the Government of Northwest Territories does have some applications in place here for the uh, Disaster Mitigation Fund uh, that are being, being looked at. We're hoping to get a, a positive answer on that. Uh, I've also, uh, at, uh, most previously at our uh, national, uh, federal, provincial, territorial meetings, brought up the concern that uh, we need to continue ha looking at other sources of funding that will impact uh, our northern communities. Um, I will continue to work with the leadership, our federal leadership, to make sure that uh, they know what kind of funds they can access and work on uh, developing those applications and uh, ensuring that we do have support um, from our other jurisdictions to support this type of funding moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. 
Or a question here, can I can the member Kamlik? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, based on the Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investments public comments on the proposed Mineral Resources Act, I have to ask, has this act been written with the collaboration of all stakeholders, or is the minister rushing to check off a mandate commitment with a piece of legislation that nobody is happy with? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That might be his approach, but not from not mine. From the Government of Northwest Territories approach, uh, we've done our due diligence on this Act. As we know, this is probably one of the most important pieces of Act coming forward in the 18th Legislative Assembly. Uh, we've been to, we've involved the Intergovernmental Council right from day one on this thing, along with their Technical Advisory Panel, which is uh, uh, the North Slave Media Alliance and the Dacho First Nations, who also attend this meeting. Uh, we've, uh, in, we've met with special interest groups, environmental non-government organizations, the Chamber of Mines. We've had public consultation in many communities with, no, with lots of feedback. We had Aboriginal consultation and uh, for the most part uh, the reason we're bringing this bill forward is part of the, uh, the devolution of process to bring this thing forward. But with all this consultation uh, that has taken place in um, in-person public meetings that we've had, there's a lot of support for this bill coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Or a question that Kedada Cassie member Cam Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would expect the, that that response to be what the minister would say publicly whenever asked, and yet he gave very different comments in the uh, uh, January 30th edition of the Yellowknifer. Can the minister explain why he made those comments? Thank you. Merci. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I make a lot of comments, just like the member across the hall here. Um, I've, sta I've actually said I've used this comment a number of times. This is a very large piece of legislation that is going to affect a large number of people in the Northwest Territories, from industry to Aboriginal governments to the person on the street to the business person down the down the road. And when you have that many people involved in a bill that's this important and this big, not everybody's going to agree on a piece of legislation. There might be things in there we all agree on. But no different than this House, this is built on consensus and collaboration with stakeholders in the Northwest Territories. And with that being said, not everyone's going to agree on everything at all times. And uh, this bill that, that, that's going to be brought forward here in the, the life of this Assembly is going to not be supportive by everybody. It's no different than everything else and what we did in this House last week. But we will continue to push this thing forward for the best interests of the residents of the Northwest Territories. And I think the departments did a great amount of work that will be representative in this bill when committee takes it on the road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Or question, Tadadea Kasi, member Cam Lake. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I mean, surely, surely the, the minister is, is happy with the quality of the consultations, is happy with what the bill's going out there. I acknowledge that differences are, are what makes this House so strong and what makes our society so strong. But to hear that from the minister makes me question whether he is satisfied with the quality of the legislation. Is, can the minister clarify that? Thank you. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, in my previous comments, not everybody will be happy with everything in this bill, including me. Uh, this, is, this bill is built on collaboration and consensus of people of the Northwest Territories. I support the bill that we're bringing forward. I believe it is, is the bill at the right time for the right industry that we're doing is through devolution process. This is a bill that people in the Northwest Territories are clearly interested in. As I said, this is probably one of the biggest and most important ones in this Legislative Assembly. And uh, if the member does not like the comments I make in public, that's, that's up to him. Uh, I support this bill. We've done our due diligence. We've worked with all the residents of Northwest Territories, as I've said, and we'll be bringing this thing forward in this city. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good answer. Merci. Or a question. No, did I ask member Cam Lake? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's not that I don't like the comments, that the comments are confusing, and I think a reasonable person would assume different from uh, uh, the, the contrasting, the logical contrast of the two comments made. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister just said he's not happy with all the, the sections of, of the legislation, so if he could speak globally, what would he like to see, uh, what would he like to see come forward that wasn't included? Thank you. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's getting into the content of the bill, and the bill has not reached the floor of the House. And if that member wants to ask me that question when I'm sitting in the committee to hold, have at her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good
Merci. Or question, you can add Kenny the member of South too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following up to my uh, questions earlier, my question today is to the Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Is the Minister or his department aware of the Astro Gold property that I referred to earlier? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I am well aware of uh, Embrim uh, uh, Astro Gold project in the SAT 2. Uh, they have uh, been doing some work out there. They actually uh, accessed our geo database that uh, we have housed in the Northwest Territories Geoscience Department. And this was actually when I, in discussions with them, when I was talking to them at Roundup, this actually came from a presentation when the Premier and I were at PDAC, and uh, the department uh, laid out a, a water till sample that they did. Uh, in the Satu region, and that's where these guys got some uh, actual information to start having a look at that district. Uh, Embrim also uh, used our uh, mining incentive program last year. They got $160,000 to go towards their work, and they're also engaging our community and client service unit uh, regarding our activities in the minute in the members riding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Or a question that kid today, Cassie, member Satu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that uh, reply and information here. It seems that there's some dialogue going back and forth, which sounds encouraging. My next question, what is N. Evram plans to keep the project moving forward? Musty, musty, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is early in the ball game with uh, with these guys, but uh, the exciting uh, the news release that they put out that was right when we were all down at the Mineral Roundup, uh, and it was very timely because we actually had a meeting set up with them with Embrim and Newmont and had some discussions of what they're planning on doing and uh, as I said in my earlier comments, how they got to where they are. They are going to do a drill test program. Uh, I think it was in their new news release, but if it isn't, they are going to do one this summer which is hopefully going to take place uh, uh, earlier on in the summer. But the one thing that, that I want to state is this is an early discovery. Uh, it's a new gold discovery, an entirely new type of gold deposit in the Northwest Territories that hasn't been seen before. And if we're lucky, maybe we're going to be witnessing something that's very similar to what just took place in the Yukon with the, with the new white gold district that's happening there. But they are very bullish on this piece of property, and we look forward to working with them going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Or question, Tadadei Akasi, member Satu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that reply. It seems that the uh, cost of going to Vancouver is bearing some fruit. My uh, third question to the Minister of ITI is, uh, w will the GWT be signing a SEA with Embrim to ensure that the Satu residents and businesses benefit from the work in, in their region? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that might be a little premature about doing an SEA. Uh, the, these guys haven't even put a drill on the ground yet, uh, but they're very bullish, as I said, on their project. The department is, uh, has demonstrated time and time again that we want to uh, focus on getting benefits to residents of the Northwest Territories, to the people working, to small businesses, uh, and getting all the benefits we can out of the resources from these types of projects, and we'll be following these guys closely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question. member Satu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My last question to the Minister, is there any plans for your, these two companies, uh, Newmount and uh, Everham, to uh, come to our, our capital in the near future? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not aware of them coming here uh, anytime soon. They'll probably get a hold of me if they if they are going to come here and have a discussion. Uh, the last thing that I left on uh, on the conversation on the table with them when we were meeting with them was about the community engagement. I strongly suggested that they in involve the residents of the SAT two in their project and keep them up updated on a on a not a day by day basis, but on you know on a very regular basis, so they get an idea of what's going on out there. I continually stress that, particularly in Satu, because that's been an oil-driven and gas-driven resource 
area of the Northwest Territories and mining history goes a long ways back there and there has not been any mining activity in that region for a long time. So I want them to engage early and often. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've been approached by a number of leaders to explain how the intergovernmental resource revenue sharing agreement worked. From what I've been able to find prior to the implementation of Devolution 2014, the GNWT and Aboriginal Group signed the NWT uh, Interdepartmental Resource Revenue Sharing Agreement with 25% of the net profit going to uh, Aboriginal groups uh, according to a formula. Uh, it is my understanding the allocation is made each year of the signatures, uh, signatories of the development uh, devolution agreement. Um, in there, the formula there, it says uh, Aboriginal organized population not yet party to the agreement shall be retained by the GNWT. So my questions are for the Premier. Can the, can the Premier please explain what it's meant by retaining for the G, retained by the GNWT? Thank you. Masi. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The retained portion is a, an estimated calculation for those Indigenous governments who have not signed on to devolution. Each year, once annual net fiscal benefit figures are available, these retained amounts are distributed according to Intergovernmental Council member negotiations that are guided by the provisions of the Intergovernmental Resource Revenue Sharing Agreement. These negotiations occur after Intergovernmental Council members receive their respective allocations of the net fiscal benefit under the Intergovernmental Resource Revenue Sharing Agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. question member Nehende. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the Minister providing, uh, Premier providing that answer. Mr. Speaker, does the government hold the shares for Aboriginal organization populations that have not signed on to the agreement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, no, the government of the Northwest Territories identifies for the other parties to the agreement that there are retained revenues available and begins discussions on how they are to be allocated. And the other parties are the Indigenous governments that have signed on to devolution, and they see this as Indigenous government money. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, oral question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, min the Premier for clarifying that answer. Um, Mr. Speaker, does the government allocate funding from the, the retained part of this pot of the money to the Arctic Energy Emerging Technologies Conference and Trade Show in Inuvik? And if not, how does the GNWT help support this conference and trade show? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, once again, retained amounts have not been used to support Indigenous governments to attend the Arctic Energy Emerging Technologies Conference and Trade Show in Inuvik. The government of the Northwest Territories Infrastructure Department has not provided funds for Indigenous governments, delegates, to participate in the Arctic Energy Emerging Technologies Conference and Trade Show and does not anticipate doing so in the future. Indigenous governments are, however, free to allocate the funds however they see fit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thanks to the Premier. This is probably a redundant question anyway, but I'm going to ask it to the Premier anyway. So does the government allocate funding from the retained part of this pot to be sent to send Aboriginal group or government delegates to the Association of Mineral Exploration in Vancouver? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, retained amounts have not been used to support Indigenous government delegates to attend AME. For AME Roundup, the GNBT ITI Department uses funds allocated under the Mineral Development Strategy to client services and community relations for Aboriginal capacity funding. 
From those funds, a certain amount is used to support Indigenous government delegations to attend AME. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, Canon, the member from Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My questions are for the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. First off, I'd like to commend the Minister for fast-tracking public consultation on changes to the Employment Standards Act and to indicate my strong support for including domestic violence leave. Uh, the public consultation on this process ended January the 14th. Can the Minister tell us what the next steps are? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the compliment from the uh, MLA. I appreciate that. Uh, not only is it parental and family caregiver leave within this act, we're looking at domestic violence that was brought up, but also uh, domestic workers, example, nannies, to make sure that they're covered as well. So we did the uh, stakeholder consultation that was brought. We will be bringing forward a uh, what we heard document in March here coming up, and then we right now we're um, finalizing the legislative proposal at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, the kid there, Cassie member, Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président, and thanks to the, uh, the Minister for that. So, I've expressed my disappointment that we won't be able to meet the federal implementation date of uh, the, the uh, employment insurance changes on March the 17th for improved uh, parental benefits in the Northwest Territories. Can uh, the Minister tell us when we can expect to see amendments to our employment standards that come forward to this House? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, as stated earlier, we're just in the finalization of doing a what we heard document and, and drafting up a legislative proposal. We are going to be introducing it, bringing it forward in the uh, next session in May, June. Um, and then, of course, uh, members have the 120 days to take it out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question. Cassie, member Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président, and thanks to the Minister for that. Well, if I have anything to do with it, that bill's going to fly straight through here. So, um, uh, what, boy, I actually get an applaud from the other side of the house for a change. Uh, one of the easiest ways we can extend uh, improved uh, federal parent, parental leave benefits to our employees is to mend relevant collective agreements. And I know that's a sensitive area, Mr. Speaker, but uh, right now, but can the minister tell us whether our government has made an offer to the relevant unions to mend collective agreements to allow our employees to take full advantage of the improved parental leave benefits? I'll see, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The MLA actually answered his own question. At this moment, I cannot speak on anything happening with the union. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question. No, did I ask you, Member Frame Lake? <laughs> Merci, Monsieur the, the President. Well, thanks to the Minister for that. Look, I just want uh, my colleagues in the House and the public to understand that there's some uh, more steps that we have to do to make sure that our families and, and parents enjoy the best possible benefits. But um, so. Uh, lastly, Mr. Speaker, uh, as our government is obviously going to lag behind the improved parental benefits offered by the federal government nationwide, I'd like to ask the Minister what lessons we have learned from this experience to make sure that our families receive the best possible benefits in the future. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I guess uh, there's, a, there's many lessons that come, and, and so one of the lessons is that life changes constantly. Don't get used to static quo because it changes all the time. So that's something I've realized, and that's something we need to be conscious of within this House because that's what we're here for, to be abreast of it and to make changes. Another lesson I learned is, um, and that's not only through this, but work together. Work with your cross-jurisdictional, work with your partners in other jurisdictions and the federal government because it's important. Um, a third lesson that I've learned is uh, even though I really want to work closely with the federal government, sometimes the federal government doesn't work on our schedule. And so um, I'm not sure how to fix that because, of course, all jurisdictions have different setting times. They have different uh, voting times. So it is an issue. Um, I'm glad our senator's in the House. It could be probably be brought forward. Um, it would be wonderful <laughs> to have more partnerships, more working together whenever federal bills come out or acts come out that affect the jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Merci. Oral question. Here, can I can the member Mackenzie Delta. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, follow up to my member's statement of two questions for the Minister of Infrastructure. As I stated in my statement, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're taking a lot of employment away from the community of Tsigachik, not to mention Fort McPherson. At times, we even hired uh, a number of people from the community there when we didn't have enough. So I'd like to ask the Minister, why did the Department decide to bring in their equipment to be used at the Mackenzie River crossing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll have to get back to the member on what exact piece of equipment, why we brought it in and, and uh, why we brought it there. But I do know that we have a labor and equipment uh, uh, contract and as an N1 with uh, with with already uh, Red River Development Corporation, so I can look into that matter which specific piece of equipment the member is talking about. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question, Akira Reikasi, member Mackenzie Delta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I could just answer that right now because I, I come from Sigachik, so I know what's there. We have uh, snow cats, bombardiers, which I think they brought out of the museum. They're so old, but uh, <laughs> you know, these equipment, they're barely running. And I think that's where all the cost is coming from is because to find these parts, uh, you know, price must double or triple or something. But what cost savings is the, is the department making by using their own equipment compared to past years? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Infrastructure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to look into this as the members has stated, but one thing that people know in this house is we've uh, escalated our time of, of putting in the snow crossing. Uh, the big controversy in this assembly two years ago was us shutting down the Winter Road uh, ferry program. And when we did that, the, the department made the commitment that we would put in the crossing as fast as possible, which we've had. Uh, it's it's uh, from freeze up to actually having uh, 5,000 kg capability has been a very minimal days now. I think believe less than two weeks for both crossings. Uh, we have, it, we've uh, involved new technologies and lighter pieces of equipment, which might influence which pieces of equipment that we're actually trying to uh, rent from uh, the Red River Development Corporation. Uh, but I will work with the member and get the, the answers that he wants on the, on these specific questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question, Tadadayakasi, member Mackenzie Delta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, bringing, this, bringing in this equipment actually didn't, didn't uh, save us any time. We actually just finished the ice bridge like two weeks ago. If I didn't say anything, we'd probably still be working on it now. But, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I know the department's trying to do the best they could, but uh, will the minister ensure that next year the community is given support to providing employment for their workforce? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, we're there is we're witnessing as efficiently and as fast as we can. Um, the workforce was uh, is contracted out with Little Red River. I'll have to see how long that contract's good for and work with the member to be able to maximize the most employment they can for his particular riding. But uh, we have not reduced the capital cost or the budgetary process we're putting this road in. We realize that the pressures that's on these communities the longer it takes to put in these ice crossings across the Northwest Territories. Uh, and the member continually raises it in this assembly and we will continually try to work with him and his communities to put it in as fast as possible. Uh, and work with his communities where they can benefit from these th projects that are right in their back door. So I will continue to work with the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. All question. Nundere Akasi, member Mackenzie Delta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it sounds promising. Um, you know, in the past, like I, I've even worked on that ice road when I first started working, but uh, you know, the workforce they have set up in the community. You know, they, they work pretty hard all through uh, November until uh, mid-December. And usually, usually by the 20th, they have everything open to, to uh, 50,000 kilograms, which is required. And then they, they let Mother Nature do its part. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, it seems to me the department doesn't seem to support providing labor employment, but would rather bring in equipment that actually took longer 
and at a higher cost. I'd like to ask the Minister if this is the case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, that is not the case. As I said, we're trying to put this thing as efficiently and as fast as we can for the residents, particularly in his home community. Uh, we do, we've made the, the unprecedented step where we put the Arctic Red River in first now so the community can actually get out of there sooner and cross over to go to McPherson. Uh, we can actually pull that maybe and put that money towards the, the main crossing if the member wants to, to spend in this community, but that's going to mean that the, they're going to have to wait a lot longer to get out of there. So I've committed in this house that I'll work with the member closely to try to maximize the benefits for his residents and what we can do in next year's uh, winter season. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, can I can in the member Trinidad Willoughby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in uh, my member statement, I talk about, uh, I guess, uh, maybe perhaps a redevelopment of the Tolson um, Hydro Dam. I'd like to ask the Minister of um, ITI, I, I suppose, uh, questions uh, on the um, uh, high, um, Pulse and Hydro Dam. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister um, if he is aware that there is an organized community on the Tolson River larger than some of the current communities that we have. Thank you. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not, I'm not quite clear on the question. Um, what, what I said in the House last week here when we talked about the Tulson project was we're involving the three Indigenous governments that are affected in the region, the Northwest Territories Métis Nation, the Salt River First Nation and the Acacho. I've met with all three of them from their leadership point of view and given them a heads up about the announcement on this funding. And as I've said in the House last week, there seems to be a willingness to work towards uh, supporting this project, but that's what this Aboriginal engagement money is going to be for. It will clearly lay out what what needs to be done with the work going forward. Uh, there's a number of things that have to be done, done, but one of the best things I think about this project is the far-reaching reconciliation around economic development with Indigenous governments on a project like this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question was um, if the Minister was aware there is an organized community in, on the Tolson River. Um, but uh, I'll move on. Um, um, I would like to ask the Minister um, if he was aware <laughs> of that there was a community called Rush River, an organized community, and surveyed, surveyed lots and complete with surveyed lots. Um, if the minister would find a way to consult with the people that actually lived in Rush River prior to the construction of the dam. Thank you. Hey. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this point right now, as I said, I clearly laid out the three, three indigenous governments that uh, the government is willing to engage with. Um, I'm willing to go into the communities to have a discussion with the local communities of Fort Resolution, Fort Smith, and uh, Lutzoke in particular. Uh, and at that point, uh, maybe that's when the, there'll be an opportunity for some questions from the regular members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, Tadadeh, Cassie Member, Tunade Wolade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, it appears as though uh, the minister is not fully aware of who was impacted. Um, and that's what I'm trying to get at here. Um, the greatest impact um, of the Tolson Dam was upon the people that lived in a place called Russia River. I'm a, I'm a person that is from Russia River. Um, and uh, what happened there was uh, the school burnt down. Uh, a few years before the Tolson Dam was constructed, many people felt that that uh, was, uh, was deliberate. But 
The bottom line is there was a group of people living there in an organized community. They had stores, two stores. They had a school, um, and they were a regular functioning community. And suddenly, um, there's, there's, after the school burnt down, the people started moving. The people moved to the river to trap trap on the rivers, uh, continue to use uh, Tolson as, a, as basically a lifeline for all the people there. And then the dam was... Uh, member uh, Tunade Walade, what's your line of question? Can the GNWT start working now with the elders? the re remaining elders um, uh, that were from Rush River to start developing a list of the families that were impacted as a result of Tolson Dam. Thank you. Masi, Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, I'm willing to have a discussion with the, all impacted residents on this project. Um, you know, if we're going to sit down and have a discussion about the, the Tolson Dam back when it was built in the 60s, uh, you know, I think that if that's a discussion that, that some of the, the members' writing wants to take place, I think we're going to have to have all parties at the table for that discussion. That's, that's something that took, hap took place prior to devolution. That was under the federal government's watch. And that's probably a discussion that should be taking place with the federal government or maybe even at the Acatro main table. Uh, but I'm willing to sit down with all residents in the South Slave that are impacted by, the, by us that want to move this project forward and have those discussions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question. No did I cast member Tuna de Willoughby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, when people are relocated, they're scattered all over the place because they don't have a home. And 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 they ended up, yes, in Fort Resolution, yes, in Yellowknife, some in Hutsalke, some in Edmonton, Hay River. They're all over the place. There is no home, they're scattered around. I'm asking the minister, these are the people that were greatly affected. I'm asking the minister, I agree that for resolution, fortunately, it's okay, they, they, that, that will capture the majority of the, of, of the people. Um, however, um, there is a group that's gonna be missed unless we pull that list together. So I'd like to ask the minister again, um, if he is prepared to work with, with uh, if, if it's the Aboriginal groups that needs needs to work with the Aboriginal governments, pardon me, that he needs to work with, then if he would develop a list to see who was originally impacted and include them in, in the discussions moving forward for the redevelopment of Tolson Dam. Thank you. Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, I'm willing to have a conversation with anybody, but this is a conversation that has to include more than just me. As I said, this is something that happened not under our watch, under the federal government's watch. There's other opportunities for, for those people to have those discussions at different venues, as I've said. I'm willing to have those discussions, and I, I suspect through more consultation with Indigenous governments and their leadership on moving this project forward, uh, I can raise this question of, of around the impacted residents and what, see what the leadership wants to do in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oral question, you can ask Canyon, the member of Yonline North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today my questions are for the Minister of Lands. Um, some time ago, uh, the Department of Lands started uh, some really good work and some consultation with regard to the uh, Yellowknife Area Recreational uh, Land Use Framework, I suppose. And um, it went great guns for the first couple of years. And now it seems as though it's been put on pause. It might have gone back into the, into the, to the archives or onto the shelf. So I'd like to ask the Minister, if he can uh, let us know what is underway with regard to the uh, recreational land use planning and uh, maybe even explain for folks what uh, a recreational land use plan consists of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, several years ago, we uh, uh, looked into this matter and have our uh, recreational leasing management uh, framework to, to guide us in this area. With respect to the uh, Yellowknife uh, periphery area, much of the, the work has been done. It uh, is, of course, a commitment of this uh, government to advance this uh, process. We did recognize in the uh, framework that there would be certain areas that uh, are of priority, and clearly the Yellowknife area is a priority because of the heavy uh, recreational use. 
I can advise that we are continuing to uh, attempt to engage with our Aboriginal partners <coughs> in that matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Oral question. Makita uh, there, Kasi, member Yonlin North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his reply. Can the Minister maybe elaborate a little bit more on um, why there is a re what, what is the reasoning for a recreational land use plan? My understanding is that they're not fairly well used throughout the territory, if at all, that this version might be a pilot to some degree. Why a rec recreational land use plan? Why can't we just have recreational land use included in the comprehensive land use plans? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Lands. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we uh, are attempting to make progress in uh, land use uh, planning uh, generally, but if looked at from another point of view, recreational land use planning is kind of a subset of uh, the larger issue of dealing with uh, land management. So we thought that because of the heavy pressure in the Yellowknife area in particular, that we would attempt to move forward on that project, which is a mandate commitment. Thank you. Masi. Oral question, Tadadea Kasi, member of Young Life North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, well, I appreciate the Minister's answer. It seemed to be a little bit lacking in some detail, but he did refer earlier to uh, the recreational lease management framework, which is, um, it, I guess, it supports the, the recreational land use plan. And so I'd like to ask the Minister, can the Minister uh, provide maybe a little bit more uh, insight on what the recreational lease management framework consists of? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Minister of Lands. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The uh, fr framework deals with many issues, such as application of the framework, the development of the uh, framework, and also identifying priority areas. And as I mentioned earlier, a priority area is clearly that area around, uh, around Yellowknife. The, the point of the framework was to encourage compliance, strengthen enforcement, and give residents of the Northwest Territories certainty, or as much certainty as we could in this area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, oral question. Nundere Kasi, member Yonlife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate the Minister's reply, and yes, uh, definitely as it relates to those who have uh, leases, in particular on the Ingram Trail around Yellowknife, I would uh, like to ask the Minister, uh, under the forthcoming recreational land use, or sorry, the recreation, recreational lease management framework, uh, will there be an opportunity at some point in time where leaseholders will actually have the opportunity to have ownership of this land? Fee simple title. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi, Minister of Lands. Conflicts there. <laughs> uh, that is uh, an interesting uh, question. <laughs> And uh, I can see I can get some help from my fellow cabinet ministers on this, uh, this issue. However, uh, members will, will recall the, uh, the difficulties we have been facing with the issue of equity leases, which is a much smaller issue than this. I certainly will take the uh, question uh, seriously, and it seems to me that we're not yet ready to make the kind of commitments requested by the member opposite. Thank you. Merci. Oral question, you can ask Canon the member Decho. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I was very pleased uh, when I attended the opening of the Dental Wellness Centre on the Hotel Dechi First uh, Nation Reserve in January. And uh, the old building of the Natchez JK Treatment Centre, with people being very familiar with the, the centre then, um, was a treatment centre for the whole NWT. Uh, now things have changed. Um, the Minister clearly stated, um, um, Minister of Health and Social Services, uh, its ongoing initiatives on land-based land uh, mobile addiction treatment and, and also um, aftercare for patients that are seeking to uh, sober up in the NWT. Uh, my, my question is to, um, to the Minister of Health and Social Services. The, the last agreement uh, that the um, Dental Wellness Centre was operating on was from 2017. Um, then the discussion of the purpose and use of the, uh, the Wellness Centre was being discussed. And so now that uh, the Wellness Centre is operating and serving its purpose, uh, 
Does the minister need um, see a need in terms of ad updating the contribution that, uh, agreement that it has with KFN? Merci. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to the Nets of JK facility, we've had a lot of discussion with KFN on that building. Currently, the Department of Health and Social Services is covering the least costs on that building for KFN, which equates to about $6,000 a month. And infrastructure, the, uh, the owner of the building is currently working with KFN to see about transferring actual ownership of that building over to them. I know that there's some issues that they still need to work on on that. Uh, with respect to the programming that they, KFN had intended to deliver in those services, they talk about wellness uh, programs and other types of things. We're, we're happy to work with them on those programs uh, and we're happy to help utilize that facility on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, as far as the wellness money they get, that is a set allocated amount based on, on population, other things that all communities, uh, all Indigenous communities in Northwest Territories get and we, we don't, that's federal money that flows through us to them so we don't have the ability to increase those funds at this time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I see. Oral question, the Kidder Air Cassie member, Decho. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, um, the, the, the Minister of obviously and his department is engaging with uh, the Hotel Dechi First Nations and trying to set the, at least determine the whole role of the old uh, Nazi uh, uh, Gare Treatment Center. Uh, what are the key steps that the Minister is, is undertaking to ensure that? Eventually, the transfer of the building is given to the Hotel Dechi First Nations. Masi. Masi. Minister of Health and Social Service. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the last government, we, we made a commitment to Ketla Dechi that we would, uh, we would work with them so that they could obtain ownership of that building. Uh, the building is not a health and social services asset. Once the uh, facility ceased being an a, uh, addictions treatment center, uh, the ownership of that building was transferred back to, to infrastructure and they are working clo closely with Catlett Dechi to work out the, the issues around turning that building over to them. Uh, in the last government we committed to providing the O&M funds necessary to keep that building in operation. Not programs, but building itself and we still live by that commitment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, Tadadaya Kasi, member Decho. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, Addictions, of course, is uh, a big concern in the NWT. Um, you know, it's this people contemplating, uh, you know, taking the steps in terms of bettering their lives and getting away from the whole cycle of uh, uh, addiction abuse. You know, sometimes come across the fact that it's deep rooted, and that uh, you know this government needs to be in a position of um, supporting communities and giving back control to communities. So my question is some. Um, uh, the Hatel Deche asked the GWT Health and Social Services if they will work with the Wellness Centre on developing an NWT Trauma Treatment Centre um, on the reserve. Merci. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. Mr. Speaker, we, we have been trying to work closely with Catley Deche. In uh, 2015, we gave them $44,000 <coughs> so that they could hold a round table to help come up with some ideas and plans for how that building would be utilized. Uh, it was my understanding the report I saw for them was about turning it into more of a wellness center to provide a wide range of programs and not be dedicated to just one type of program. At that time, we indicated we'd like to keep working with them if there was some opportunity for us to deliver some workshops or other things, wellness programs uh, out, of that, uh, out of that facility on a one-off basis. We were hoping to have the opportunity to have those discussions with them so that we could do that. Uh, as far as any other specific purpose for that building, our commitment to provide the O&M funds to keep that building operational were consistent with them continuing to run that building uh, as a wellness centre providing programs focused on healing and wellness, not necessarily on addictions, but it would be a great facility that we could certainly have some discussions on about using it for mobile treatment options in partnership with Catholic HA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, no did I cast a member that show. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just all my observation, this department and the GWT and the community of Atla Deche First Nations are, are taking great positive steps. And uh, it was a sense of optimism back in the beginning of uh, New Year 2019 that the building was reopened. So my last question is to the Minister of Health and Social Services. Um, uh, what in his mind is the key critical next step of ensuring that the Dennis Wellness Centre is fully supported by this government and fully operational. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. 
Mr. Speaker, there's many things, and I think we obviously need to keep working together on this. Uh, but I think one of the key things is working with Catla Deche to actually get ownership of the building uh, figured out and solidified. Uh, there, there's some issues, I think, on both sides that we're trying to address. Uh, we want to make sure the building is in, in good shape uh, it, when, we, when it's turned over to them, and that we understand the, 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 the magnitude of O&M costs for keeping that building running. So I think that's one thing that we need to continue to work with them to get on. From health and social services on the, on the program side, we want to keep having a relationship with them and, and focus on the opportunities to do things like wellness program and other things that we could partner on, on a one-off application-based kind of approach. But I think there's lots of opportunity here. It's a great building. It, it, the community wants to do proactive things, and we'd like to keep having that, that relationship with them. Thank you. Merci. Or a question here, can I can the member of Young Life Center? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Health and Social Services. As I mentioned in my statement, my hope and expectation is that the next anti-poverty action plan will include well-defined goals for which there is required funding for implementation, along with robust evaluation. Can the Minister tell me whether this is a realistic expectation? Thank you. Minister of Health and Social Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we heard clearly from the participants of the roundtable and also individuals who submitted a number of written submissions afterwards, uh, uh, often encouraged by the Honourable Member for, uh, for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, there's a lot of input, a lot of, lot of suggestions have come in. We're trying to incorporate those. We, we can't accept them all uh, just on face value. Some of them we, we need to do a little bit more digging to see if they can be incorporated. Our plan right now, Mr. Speaker, is to finalize the drafting here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, take it through cabinet, get their endorsement to send it to committee. Committee, I, I hope that we have some good to and fro on that document to make sure that we're, we're getting it as strong as can be, incorporating the types of discussions that the member has identified here uh, so that we can release the document uh, in the spring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, Akira Dea Kasi, member of Young Life Centre. Merci, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the detail that the Minister provided in his answer. So I, I want to go into the specifics a little bit. Uh, food security was a high-profile issue at the most uh, recent Anti-Poverty Roundtable. In addition to funding food banks and soup kitchens, does the Minister have a plan to develop a long-term systemic solution to help the one in three children who experience hunger in the NWT? Merci. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. The other one. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and I, I know the member is, is aware of this because she's been involved in this file for a very long time, and I appreciate the work that she has she has brought to the brought to this uh, this uh, particular issue. But this isn't just a health and social services issue. This is a, a, a territorial issue. This is a responsibility of all people in the Northwest Territories, and there's multiple partners on that. Uh, ITI is doing work around community gardens. The other thing, education, culture, and employment is doing work around food programs for school uh, for school age children. Uh, there is money through the Anti Poverty Fund. Uh, we are trying to make as much progress in this area as, as we can. It may not, uh, the money might flow through different initiatives, but it's all supporting uh, addressing poverty here in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question. Tada Dea Kasi, member of Young Life Center. Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go at that question in a different way. So, um, food security is just the example, but the real point I'm trying to get to is funding short-term solutions and funding long-term solutions, and whether there is any intention by the government to look at a set of long-term solutions to issues like food security, which would um, provide uh, solutions that don't have to be uh, constantly updated, but would be in, in place for all residents of the NWT over the long term. Merci. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to food security, I think ITI is doing an awful lot of work for uh, getting community gardens and and other mechanisms in our communities. I think the 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 commercial fish uh, work that we're doing, I think, goes a long way to food security. One of the things that Health and Social Services is doing, it's building upon the work that's being done by I ITI, is we're modifying legislation to allow people to sell produce that they are growing in their in their in their own gardens. Uh, the next step will be finding ways through regulation policy to allow people to sell uh, more complicated food uh, like meats and other things. These are things that will last 
for, for extended periods of time. Uh, but we have to do it right. We have to make sure that we're doing it to ensure that people are eating safe foods if it's being sold. So those are the types of things. Those aren't the only things. Uh, this is certainly an area that we need to keep having more and more discussion as, as, as better technologies, more information comes to the table. But we are trying to make improvements in this area. And we'll be working with our partners, including federal government, territorial government, communities, uh, and NGOs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral question, no data Cassie member, Yale Knife Center. Uh, merci, Mr. Speaker. Finally, uh, my last question is, at the workshop, the minister talked about securing business and charitable partners to uh, leverage additional funding for anti-poverty initiatives. I'm wondering if the minister can tell us what progress he's made and what the plan is for that. Merci. Merci. Minister of Health and Social Service. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have reached out. Uh, but at this point in time, we haven't managed to increase the level of funding through, uh, through partners. Uh, but you don't stop after asking once, you ask multiple times, and we will keep pushing some, some of these organizations to see if they're willing to uh, step up to the plate. Uh, some, some may, some may not, but we'll keep trying. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Oral questions? Oral questions? Written questions? Written questions? Returns to written questions. Returns to written questions. Replies to commissioner's opening address. Replies to commissioner's opening address. Replies to budget address, day four of seven. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. This will be my last reply to the budget address for the 18th Assembly, and I look forward to thunderous applause from my colleagues across the way. Uh, I've organized uh, my reply in the following manner <coughs> with some general comments, a review of the process, revenues and departmental highlights. I conclude with some advice to future assemblies. Cabinet's cuts to programs and services appear to have come to an end, except for one department, and that's environment and natural resources, and I'll have more to say on that issue a little later. We continue to run up a debt as a, uh, as a result of large infrastructure projects. The debt is now $1.1 billion, only $200 million away from the debt wall. The largest infrastructure project for 2019-20 will be the Tlicho All-Season Road, $46.8 million. We have a cabinet that is adrift in a maze of mandate commitments that it cannot possibly hope to complete. Uh, a lot of funding is finally flowing from the federal government, but this is now shaping our direction and investments. This is not necessarily a bad thing, as cabinet is stuck in the roads to resources paradigm, and the federal funding has at least forced us to look beyond this approach. It's a sad comment that we have to look to the federal government for improved action on housing for our citizens or applying carbon pricing to combat climate change. For the fourth year in a row, no public consultation was carried out with regard to the budget. I contrast this with the last several finance ministers who would carry out pre- and post-budget meetings. In addition to the lack of public consultation, and despite my previous recommendations, there was no consultation with regular MLAs to help set priorities in developing the business plans. Again, the quality and consistency of the departmental budgets or business plans varied widely. Some contained very little detail on activities for 2019-20. We are not using outpaced, output based, or sorry, we are using out output-based performance indicators rather than tracking outcomes and there are questionable risk profiles. As I said last year, cabinet ministers to pay, need to pay much more close attention to their business plans appropriate to the investment of $1.9 billion in public funds. We are still waiting for responses from cabinet on the very modest budget request from regular MLAs which will come to light as the process rolls out through the House. Cabinet dropped in very significant changes from the business plans to the main estimates in the order of more than $20 million with no explanation. We had to ferret out these changes and seek information. Some of the responses are yet to arrive. Revenues. We will raise almost as much money from tobacco taxes, $15 million, and liquor revenues, $25 million, as we get from resource royalties at $47 million. 
Very little, if anything, has been accomplished in terms of increasing or even stabilizing own source revenues. Reviews of resource royalties have been pushed off to the 19th Assembly with no guarantee this will be public, while literally tens of millions of dollars of potential revenues flow out of the Northwest Territories, as shown by ITI's own consultants. Changes to the territorial formula funding arrangement would also be helpful in ensuring that we get to keep more of our own source revenues, but little, if prog little progress, if any, has been made by our Cabinet on this matter. One member in this House referred to the consultation process underway on the sugar, sweet and beverage tax as a cynical effort to check off a box. I would like to... I would liken it to a Led Zeppelin that was never intended to get off the ground. I have already described in this House how the carbon pricing system developed by Cabinet is not fair and it is doubtful whether it will really help us achieve our climate change commitments. While $16.2 million will be raised, large emitters will get all of the money back that they pay and only $3.7 million will be reinvested. It will be individuals, families and small businesses that are subsidizing the limited reinvestment in renewables, not industry. There has been no income tax reform during this assembly. Cabinet refuses to add a high earner tax bracket, unlike the federal government and other jurisdictions. Lastly, despite my continuing to raise these issues year after year, there does not appear to be any progress on indexing the Northern Resident Tax Deduction or setting a publicly available rate for travel to southern locations to avoid the plethora of audits that plague Northerners. Departmental highlights, finance. There has been visible progress on reviewing, there has been no visible progress on reviewing the, the Heritage Fund Act as laid out in the mandate. The fund continues to lose money against inflation, has no defined revenue stream and no role for the public in its management. A very large information systems shared services unit of 71 staff is being created with many transfers from other departments. From what I can tell, the purpose is not to deliver improved service to the public, but to centralize power within the Department of Finance. We can expect to hear more about the unfair carbon tax developed by Cabinet, but I will say that the federal backstop is looking a lot better. Health and social services. There are definitely some good initiatives here from uh, one of the few departments and ministers who is not afraid to go and get additional resources. And I want to commend the minister for that. This includes over $3.3 million for child and family services, a territorial midwifery program, still waiting to see the plan, and increased resources for autism. Some of the money for the new initiatives is being taken from some other programs, and we have yet to get an adequate explanation. Most troubling is the $600,000 cut to home care services to fund child and family services improvements. Co-payments of medical travel are set to increase by $240,000, but the process and way of increasing revenues has not been explained. I've asked the Minister several times for a clear plan with timelines for the old Stanton hospital services, and I'm still waiting. Audiology wait times are clearly unacceptable, and it's not clear whether this budget will improve that situation. Benchmarking and public reporting of wait times is needed for a variety of medical and allied health services. It's hard to tell whether we are making any progress on pharmacare, recovering Métis uh, benefit payments from the federal government, and improving the non-insured health benefits program. Lastly, there is no overall plan for dealing with family violence from our government. Health and social services can and should play a central role in this initiative, but it is not clear what is happening. Industry, tourism and investment. Macroeconomic analysis does not appear to play any role in how funding is invested. Uh, diversification takes a backseat to the department's promotion of non-renewable resource development. It's good to see some limited new funding for development of a knowledge uh, economy strategy and development of wind power in Inuvik. There is a need for an agricultural pathfinder, just as there is such a function for the mining sector within ITI. No reasonable rationale has been provided for an additional deputy mining recorder as the workload is steady or even declining. Lastly, there does not appear to be any additional funds for new investment in the Yellowknife tourism sector that is still without a proper visitor centre. 
and WT Housing Corporation. Expenditures at the cor corporation will be over $100 million for 2019-20, which includes some new federal funding. The corporation should report on how this spending will work towards reducing core need and how it will work with other agencies, uh, such as the co-investment fund in the National Housing Strategy. Client-centered performance measures would also help. I've encouraged uh, improvements to the corporation's website for some time to make its programs and services more accessible, especially in light of the refocused uh, uh, initiatives within the, the corporation. The uh, corporation all needs, also needs to get very creative and get more of the federal infrastructure funding that requires cabinet to let it get to the table. For example, Nunavut is using $12 million for housing retrofits under the Low Carbon Economy Fund, where we are only using $4 million from that fund for housing improvements. Environment and Natural Resources. This is the only department that is continuing to take cuts in 2019-20 by another $1.675 million. During the term of this assembly, funding for the department has been slashed by about 10%. If there was ever any doubt that the environment is not a priority with Cabinet or the Minister, this is the evidence. Very significant delays have been experienced in getting mandate and other commitments completed. This is not because of a lack of dedication by the hard-working staff, but a lack of resources and leadership. While responsibilities have increased, for example, the climate change audit, pan-Canadian framework, tracking and reporting, the caribou crisis, new legislation developed without additional funds, funds continue to, to shrink for this department. The ENR Minister has not been able to protect this department or secure, secure additional resources despite his twin, the Minister of Finance. I was very disappointed to see that there is no new funding to address the caribou crisis. There are legal requirements for recovery strategies for both boreal and barren ground caribou as these are now classified as species at risk. There is also no new funding for the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan with its specific habitat protection recommendations. Justice. Earlier I mentioned the lack of government-wide approach or initiatives on family violence. Justice needs to play a central role with health and social services in these efforts. I am thankful for a commitment by the Minister to review victim services. I look forward to the release of that report as soon as possible and to additional resources to serve this important function offered by our government. Municipal and, government uh, municipal and community services. There has been some small progress on increasing uh, community government funding by $1.8 million in 2019-20, but we still need the plan to close the gap in the 2015 municipal funding review. Back then it was $33 million shortfall, so this needs to be updated based on our current needs. 911 is still proceeding and that is a good thing. However, there is a need for much better communications if implementation is to be achieved by July 1, 2019. Regular MLAs have urged increased investment in the NGO Stabilization Fund, so it is good to see that it is going to be doubled in 2019-20. The fund should still be moved over to the executive. The department still has a very large legislative uh, backlog, including consumer protection, municipal governance, and more. It would be helpful to have a sense of priorities to pass this on to the next assembly. Infrastructure. The department has huge carryover, sometimes almost 50% of its capital projects. The cause is not clear and it is not being tracked. It may be related to lack of capacity to get contracts out due to staff cuts in previous budgets, contractor capacity, federal funding delays, or because of payment schedules and cutoffs. At the same time, projects contracted through the department by other government agencies should not be penalized as a result of delays uh, that are within the control of Department of Infrastructure. Tracking and reporting on carryovers is required. There does not appear to be any systematic way of evaluating projects for submission to federal infrastructure programs or criteria for doing so, such as the number of jobs created, contribution towards greenhouse gas reductions, and so on. This analysis needs to take place and in consultation with regular MLAs. Given the large infrastructure projects managed by this department, poor planning often causes forced growth or actions in other departments. 
For example, another $381,000 is required in 2019-20 for ENR for additional monitoring of the Inuvik to Tuck Highway. Reporting and proactive disclosure of marine transportation services is needed in light of the failure to ship goods to coastal communities. Executive and Intergovernmental Affairs. There is still no plan for having government service officers in all our communities. The Minister has resisted calls for such services in regional centres in Yellowknife despite collaborative opportunities with Service Canada. Good work has been done to achieve gender balance with GNWT board appointments and I want to commend the Minister for that. There is, significant in, uh, there is a significant increase in ministerial travel in the Executive of $153,000 or about 30 per cent. A Northwest Territories Economic Development Summit has been established. Unfortunately, it appears to be a parallel system of priority setting with regular, regular MLAs kept on the outside. Even its agendas are confidential. Little to no progress on land rights negotiations has taken place during the 18th Assembly. The only completion has been the agreement in principle for Norman Wells self-government. I will be watching closely to see whether Cabinet has implemented the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the forthcoming resource management legislation. The recent NICO socio-economic agreement is clearly at odds with the stated approach from the Executive. It is not clear whether any additional resources are needed or have been secured for offshore petroleum negotiations. The role for regular MLAs has not been clarified. NWT Power Corporation. Regular MLAs have traditionally had very little oversight of this body. With this assembly, you have started to include the corporation as part of our budget process, but it is on a different a fiscal year. We still need to watch it very carefully, especially, especially with Cabinet going down a billion dollar road of Talton expansion. The corporation's renewable energy projects appear to be funded through the federal government and by individuals, families and small businesses once the carbon tax is put in place. Education, culture and employment. Large changes in staffing levels in the district education authorities uh, are due to declines in, enroll in enrollment. I'm disappointed that it looks like there is no funding for post-secondary education renewal. I'm pleased to note the increased funding to family violence shelters. Further staff cuts at the NWT archives appear in this budget. Uh, income support and income assistance changes are good, but we need to find a way to index these programs against inflation. The same applies for child care supports. We cannot continue to assume the lowest income families uh, can get by on the same amount of funding despite higher uh, cost of living. Lands. Land use planning is what brought me to the Northwest Territories in 1985 and I continue to support it. However, MLAs are being asked to approve $753,000 for land use planning in the Wekaji management area without any details or overall strategy uh, that should include federal funding. We've been asking for this information for months. As important as land use planning is, the Minister has decided to cut land use planning contribution funding to make up for the Department's share of its transfers to finance for the ISSS. This cut of $60,000 should simply be absorbed by finance or lands should find somewhere else to cut. Little to no progress on contaminated sites management and prevention of public liabilities uh, has occurred and that was a mandate requirement and is most of that work should be done by lands. Some sort of tracking system has yet to be completed and a manual on contaminated sites management has been in preparation for what seems like years. There's been no policy changes, uh, regulations or legislative change to ensure we reduce the risk of taking on new public liabilities. I look forward to the lessons learned from the Tlicho All Season Road Environmental Assessment where the project assessment policy was applied and seems to have failed. Uh, lands did not do very well with its coordination of GNWT participation as a result of that policy uh, and departments were not allowed to freely participate in that environmental assessment. Conclusions, Mr. Speaker, I've offered some thoughts on how to improve the budget process, including early and meaningful consultation with regular MLAs and the public. I've also recommended a more balanced approach that includes more revenues and a stronger focus on diversifying our economy. The federal government has new and different priorities for infrastructure to build a cleaner economy, more inclusive society, a low carbon economy and transformative change. 
Our government has finally started to get on board, but keeps the old blinders of infrastructure to facilitate more non-renewable resource development rather than building sustainable, energy self-sufficient communities. Transformative change can come through the emerging knowledge economy and opportunities such as the conservation economy with Fidene Nene. As I said last year, we need plans and strategies for adequate housing and universal childcare so our residents can engage in the economy. We need to get our housing out of core need while creating local jobs, provide stronger support for the arts, tourism, agriculture and the fishing industry, reduce great greenhouse gas emissions, lower the cost of living and develop a real post-secondary education system. These sectors also create more local jobs than non-renewable resource development per dollar of investment. This is the kind of leadership I still hope for in our budgets. There are some exciting initiatives in this budget and I sincerely thank my cabinet colleagues and their staff and my committee colleagues for much hard work in getting us to this point. I look forward to the debate as we move forward in our review of the 2019 budget. Must see Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Masi. <coughs> Replace the budget address day four of seven. Member for Nehende. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, my reply to the budget will be a bit different from the one I did last year. We are still working behind the scenes to get us closer to a final agreement on the budget. It's been a long process from closely reviewing the business plans to finding common ground and finally getting closer to a budget that we can agree to pass. Unfortunately, since we started the process, a number of issues have come to my attention and need to be addressed. I realize some of these concerns are not in the budget, but if we work together, we can be, they can be added via supplementary appropriation later in this session. This being the last O&M budget of the 18th Assembly, I think we're getting better at listening to one another. For a $1.873 billion budget, I believe we are, the, we're a few, we are only a few million dollars apart. Don't get me wrong, we still have work to do. Even so, Mr. Speaker, this year's business plans were a bit challenging, especially when you consider we spend more than $1.8 billion in public funds. Some department plans still lack details. There were some inconsistent typographical errors and wholesale repetitions of sections from previous business plans. I'd like to have the departments provide more detailed description of all planned activities as identified by members from this side. We need to be better informed so we can make better decisions. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister said the 2019-2020 the budget process operate expenditures of, of about $1.8 billion. As we worked through the business plan, we came up with small additional requests. Some were increases in funding, others were reinstatement of planned cuts, and others were reinvestments. I have to say we're getting closer each year. As the Minister said in his budget address, the projected operation surplus of $60 million is going directly to the 2019-2020 to the infrastructure budget. However, we still need a realistic plan for how the GNWT intends to proceed with major projects within its existing borrowing capacity and what capacity might, what circumstances might trigger the GNWT to seek an increase to the current federal imposed borrowing limit. I'm happy to see the government is investing $70 million for new initiatives and $17 million to enhance or maintain existing programs. However, some of these new allocations may not get spent, and this saddens me. As a government, we have to do better to deliver the services we promise and budget for. Mr. Speaker, I realize that most of the regions face hardships, and I empathize with them. In the handy writing, we have been experiencing this for a long period of time. All you need to do is visit the six communities, especially the small ones, to realize the hardship re residents face. We have communities that have to do job sharing so people can survive. This is hugely disappointing. Mr. Speaker, like I said last year, we need to continue to diversify, to diversify our economy. I believe tourism can play an important role in our, in our economy, especially in the handy riding. We see a number of tourists coming in our region during the summer months, but few or none during the winter. In our writings, we can see the investments that the government's making and hopes to increase the number of visitors coming to our region. This will lead to future employment and business opportunities. Oddbud. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to see the budget set aside for, for the establishment of the office of the Oddbud person. But I want to remind the finance minister that he or she is now called the Oddbud, not the Oddbudsman. The Oddbud is like a commissioner of fairness. He or she will be available to take complaints and help 
people who feel that they have been unfairly treated by the government. I think this is a good thing. I think it's also good for government because sometimes the OBUD will investigate a complaint and find out the government did do the right thing. In this case, the OBUD would be able to help explain to, to the public how the government properly follows the process. I know that some MLAs have said the GNWT doesn't the say that the Northwest Territories does not need the OBUD, but it, that comes. But that's what we're we are we are here for. But the OBUD would have the power to investigate matters in a way that the MLA cannot. I took look forward to hearing the update on the, in this house and vote when we can expect the office of it to be open. Summer students, Mr. Speaker, I'm again asking the government to work on setting up a budget line for summer students. I firmly believe that these positions are very important to in all our region and particularly in the Hende. I'd like to see a concrete plan for hiring summer students and see a budget for it. Carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, I realize the government, government didn't have any choice about implementing a carbon tax. If the GNWT didn't come up with its own, it would have been stuck with a federal backstop. With that said, however, I don't think the GNWT is going about it the right way. In this case, I don't feel the Department of Finance is, going, is doing a good, very good job listening to input from regular members. I understand the government intends to implement the carbon tax by making changes to the Material and Products Act, a tax act and income tax act. I look forward to the introduction of this, that legislation and debate in this house. Executive, government service officers. One of the good things that the government has done to, is to hire government service officers, or GSOs, in many communities to help residents in their dealing with government. This program is working and regular members have pushed hard to expand the GSO network. I am pleased to point out that this coming year there are four GSO positions in Ahende, plus one in Port Providence. On the other hand, there are still communities left out. Again and again, regular members have urged the government to complete the GSO network, expand it to all communities. The government has resisted, especially to create positions in larger centres. I will not rest until all in the Hendy regions have, the Hendy communities have GSOs and the territorial network is complete. Health, Child and Family Service Program. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to see the additional of $3.3 million to, to add 21 new positions. I agree with the GNWT that the investment will improve our services to children and family. However, I still see a number of vacancies in my riding. This makes me worry that we will still see, we will not see the boots that hit the ground with this new investment. I hope that we can find ways to get these positions filled. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to see that the, the Department of Health and Social Services provided $1.9 million to continue the implementation of the Child Youth Care Counselors Program in the Bodell in the Sawtoo. Unfortunately, I still see vacancy in Fort Layard or the, in the regional office. Now we may not see these positions filled for a long time. Again, this is a big loss for our youth and add more stress on the staff that have to cover. We need, a, do, we need to do a better job in getting these positions filled. I'm happy to see the Department of Health and Social Services provide 400000 for the land-based mobile addictions treatment and aftercare increased contribution funding and an investment of $1 million to continue implementation of the Mental Health Act. This is a very positive step toward forward in these two areas. Mr. Speaker, in the 2018-19 budget business plan, $653,000 was invested in new positions for the Bofor for Delta Rehabilitation Team as follows, one occupational therapist, one speech and language pathologist, one audiologist, and one program assistant were, need, were added to meet the needs for audiology services so that children and others will have access to service closer to home. In the 2019-20, the business plan proposes 485,000 for additional positions for the Stanton Rehabilitation Team, one occupational therapist, one speech and language pathologist, speech and language pathologist program assistance and one administrative support position. Unfortunately, this does not help the Nehendi or Daicho communities. I have heard from many parents and leaders that we need our own speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists in the Daicho. It is on my understanding that in Nehendi alone, there are over 70 people waiting service from the speech and language pathologists and over 50 waiting for the occupational therapist. The frustrating thing is that this has to be done in 11 service days. If this is one day, if there's one day of bad weather, the assessment can get 
gets cancelled for another six months. This tells me that the services are lacking for our youth in the Hendy and Daycho region. This also explains why some of our early child development EDI scores are bad. I will be adding this issue further during the session. Municipal and Community Affairs, Non-Governmental Stabilization Fund. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Municipal and Community Affairs is responsible for administrating an application-based program known as the Non-Governmental Operations or Organization or NGO Stabilization Fund. This funding provides special funding to help NGOs stabilize to develop their capacity to manage programs and services. According to the government's own policy, the NGOs delivers critical programs or, or service funded by the GNWT. The policy recognizes that if the NGO wasn't available to deliver those programs and services, the government would have either have to do the work itself or hire a third party to do it. The NGOs are often staffed or assisted by, assisted by hard-working, de dedicated volunteers who give their time and energy, putting, it, putting in long hours to help others in the communities. They do everything for providing services and support to most valuable members of our communities to advocate for literacy, sober driving, sports and recreation activities, and countless other activities enhance the life of our people. In the first year, 2009-2010, 247 was allocated for NGOs stabilization fund. It was increased to 350,000 the following year and has not been increased since, despite the fact that there are always far more requests than there is funding available. This year, in his budget address, the minister, finance minister announced the government intent to double the funding making available through the NGO Stabilization Fund. I know that every penny of this money will be put to good use, and I want to thank my cabinet colleagues for this important contribution. Gains. Mr. Speaker, this year we will see a third year of cuts for, to funding for multi-sport games. This is totally unacceptable. Two years ago, the government cut 150000 Last year they cut 250,000, and like I said last year, they were going to cut another 250,000 from the budget. True to form, this happened. It's very frustrating because these games are government responsibility. It's as either Sport North or the Aboriginal Sports Circle, the NWT, looking after them. Presently, the shortfall is coming from the department, within the department, which really means it's being taken from other programs that may lapse, lapse funding. This is not a re reliable source of funding and it's not transparent budgeting. We've heard worst case scenarios, the Department of Municipal Affairs could use the lotteries to fund multi-sport games. In my opinion, these games belong to the government and need to be a budget line within the department's budget. To see cuts in this area is very sad, to say the least. 911 emergency services. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to see the budget identified funding for the implementation of 911 emergency services in the Northwest Territories, which is supported, supposed to be to go live this summer. I believe that the 911 to the North is a positive thing. 911 is a simple number, so numbers so, so easy to remember that even a child, small child can dial it and potentially save someone's life. 911 will help those of us who travel frequently North and who may see an emergency unfold in another community without immediately knowing which prefix to use for the, se the current seven-digit emergency number in that community. It will also help visitors to the North to quickly, to quickly access emergency dispatch if they need it. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance pointed out the budget proposes of $1.3 million investment for the rollout of 911 is in the, up, in the upcoming year. What he neglected to point out, however, is that the government intends to implement a user fee for 911, meaning that the $1.3 million is intended to be paid by every phone subscriber in the Northwest Territories. Some of my regular, members call, regular member colleagues are currently reviewing Bill 31, which is, leg, is the legislation that government needs to place put in place in order to change the 911 user issue or user fee. We'll have more to say about this when legislation is debated in the House. For now, I'd, I just want to point out that the funding for 911 will be paid by the people of the Northwest Territories, not the GNWT. I would urge the GNWT as part of the 911 implement, implementation to match the funding and raise to the user fee and use the funding to ensure that the NWT has 100% cellular, co cellular coverage as the government works harder to bring more roads, highways to the Northwest Territories. Ensuring full cellular coverage will undoubtedly save lives of countless motor vehicles. 
drivers who are, who are new to drive those new highways in the future. Municipal gap funding. Mr. Speaker, Mr. for me, one of the biggest oversights in the budget is the lack of new funding to, the, to close the municipal gap. In 2014-2015, the Department of Municipal Affairs knew that it had problems with, with the way it was providing funding to the municipal governments, so the de department undertook a view of their funding approach. The, this review found that the funding formula were overlapped, complex, complex, and based on outdated information. I've also found that they didn't respond to needs and didn't respond, result in fair distribution of funding. Government to provide municipal services in the North, Northwest Territories rely on funding from the GNWT for pay for capital investments, operations, maintenance, and environmental services, including water service functions. Failure to provide funding the community government appropriately can have serious consequences for all communities in the Northwest Territories. It can result in premature failure of community infrastructure and the need for early replacement. As conditions worsen over time, it can result in loss of programs function, program functionality. This, in turn, can lead to public health and risk, risk, safety risk and environmental liabilities. When the study was done, MAC indicated an operation maintenance funding shortfall of $7.7 million, a water and sewer funding shortfall of $8.3 million, and a capital shortfall, capital shortfall of $23.4 million for a total of shortfall of $39.4 million. In the 2017-2018, the department reported uh, on its, in its annual MAC update that the gap had been reduced to $32.5 million, $5 million in operation and maintenance, $4.8 million in water and sewer, and $22.4 million in capital funding. This represents a reduction in the funding gap of $6.5 million since 2014. This year, I understand that MACA proposes to increase operation and maintenance funding by 750000 and water and sewer funding by 650000 While this is good news, there remains a good, great deal of work to be done. MACA appears to be making progress on O&M and water and sewer funding, but not so much on capital. The Department of Municipal and Community Affairs has promised a strategy to close this gap this funding gap, and we have yet to see it. In response to an oral question I posed in this House at the end of October 2018, the Minister advised that MACO will be in a position to table the municipal funding strategy by the end of this city. I look forward to this work with a great deal of anticipation. I question why it takes, has taken so long to, be, to put this strategy in place. As well, I have concerns about how funding needs may ha have grown since the initial data was collected in 2014-15 and I am worried that failure to account for the growth may mean that the actual funding gap is greater than what we what we is what is being reported I've, I have questions for the minister when we review the capital the department's budget I would urge the minister I would urge the minister will be do his best to table the municipal funding strategy early in the sitting so that we can consider it at the same time that we consider the department's budget. ECE. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the Department of Education, Culture and Employment proposed $104,000 to increase the student financial assistance course reimbursement rates from $500 to $800 and the lifetime limit of course reimbursement for $5,000 to $8,800. This will help to ensure NWT students have more opportunities to meet the demands of our, NW, our territorial labour market. This increased reimbursement will promote continued learning and support NWT residents in getting the education they need to get good jobs. With the rise, rising cost of post-secondary education, an increase to course reimbursement will make programs more accessible and affordable for NWC students, thus encouraging the NWC students to enhance their education. Small Community Employment Fund Program. Mr. Pre Speaker, I'm happy to see the changes to the Small Community Employment Fund last year. The Governor of the Northwest Territories, especially the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment, and ordinary MLAs were able to make some positive changes to it. However, we still need to do more in this area. As I stated last year, the small communities of Nehendi need more employment opportunities. People want to work, and unfortunately, the lack of jobs in small communities is a persistent high-impact problem. 
This the change last year to this program resulted in a bit more work in the communities. However, I believe the government needs to increase the fund available to small communities by $1.2 million. Mr. Speaker, I believe the continuous enhancement of this program and its policies are necessary, necessary to support its mandate for job creation in small communities. This fund should be specific for, specifically for directing use in small communities and not regional centres. Funding for the Divisional Education Offices. Mr. Speaker, I noticed that the Department of, or the Divisional Education Office has two fewer staff supporting the schools than in the Sotu region. In the Decho proper, eight communities, we have two staffs for nine schools, whereas the Sotu has four staff and five schools. It is my understanding that Sotu has two information tech technology support staff as well the DHO has one. This doesn't seem right. We need to address this or we're going to see more vulnerable children and ongoing decline in developmental test results for the DHO. This purpose for my position is that funding based strictly on the number of students doesn't work. I would like to suggest a new basic formula to the guarantees a minimum staffing regardless of the number of students. This would be based on the outstanding understanding that it does not matter how many students you have in school, you'll need a part-time custodian, principal, secretary, program support teacher, and teachers. Later on in this session, I'll speak about this session further, and I hope to see this much needed changes. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I have to say that we still have some challenges facing us, and we only have six months left in our term to address them. Let's do it right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Replies to budget address day four seven. Replies to budget address day four seven. Petitions. Petitions. Reports to standing special committee. Reports to standing special committee. Reports to committee on review of bills. Reports to committee on review of bills. Tabling of documents. Minister of Industry, Tourism, and Investment. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following two documents entitled Northwest Territories Tourism Pursuing Spectacular Potential 2019-2020 Marketing Plan, Northwest Territories Business Development Investment Corporation 2019-2020 Corporate Plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Masi. Tabling of documents. Minister of Health and Social Service. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following document entitled Follow-up Letter to Oral Question 480-18 BRAC 3 Airplane Crash Medivacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Must see. Table of documents. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I'd like to table the following five documents. Uh, Marketplace Sensitivity Analysis dated June 21st, 2018. Survey of Exploration Agreements undated. Survey of Impact Benefit Agreements undated. Uh, benefit Agreements uh, in Legislation, May 25th, 2018. Uh, lastly, Saskatchewan's Mine Surface Lease Agreement and Human Resources Development Agreement Regime Review undated. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Table of Documents. Table of Documents. Pursuant to Section 99 of the Legislative Assembly Executive Council Act, I hereby table the Northwest Territories Conflict of Interest Commissioner Annual Report to the Legislative Assembly for 2018. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Notices of motion for first reading of bills. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Wednesday, February 13, 2019, I will move that Bill 35, Supply Chain Management Professional Designation Act, be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Notices of motion for first reading bills. Notices of motion for first reading bills. Motions. Motions. First reading of bills. Minister of Industry, Tourism, and Investment. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Tabacha, that Bill 34, Mineral Resource Act, be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. First reading of bills. Yeah. 
spin, spin around B. <laughs> There's motion, motions in order. Questions been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carried. Bill 34 has had its first reading. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Consideration Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters, Minister's Statement 131-183, Table Document 322-183, with Member Hay River North in a chair. Now call Committee of the Whole to order. What is the wish of committee? Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the chair rise and report progress. Thank you. Testart, there is a motion to report progress. The motion is in order. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. I will rise and report progress. May I have the report, Member Hay River North? Mr. Speaker, your committee has been considering Minister Statement 131-18 brackets 3 and Table Document 322-18 brackets 3 and would like to report progress. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the Committee of the Whole be concurred with. Do have a seconder? Member for Yellowknife North. Motions in order. All those in favour? All those opposed? Motion carried. Merci. Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Orders of the day for Tuesday, February 12, 2019, 1.30 p.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, reports of standing and special committees, returns to oral questions, recognition of visitors in the gallery, acknowledgments, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to the commissioner's opening address, replies to the budget address, day five of seven, Petitions, reports of committees on the review of bills, tabling of documents, notices of motion, notices of motion for first reading of bills, motions, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, Bill 34, consideration and committee of the whole of bills and other matters, Minister Statement 131-183, table document 322-183, report of committee of the whole, third reading of bills, orders of the day. The stands adjourned till Tuesday, February 12, 2019 at 1.30 p.m. Oh,